welcome everyone to this this webinar where we're going to be covering how to automate your configuration with netbox nornir and graphql so three super super cool and, and three really great tools to to dive into so this is what we're we're going to cover today uh, we're going to look at well quick introduction we're going to look at a uh, the, the big picture of what we're going to what we're going to be doing today and we're going to step through things bit by bit. So first of all, we're going to look at Netbox and what Netbox is, some of its key features and some of the use cases. And then from there, we're going to look at GraphQL for kind of getting some data out from Netbox and how we can work with GraphQL and, and build some, some queries. And then we're going to look at Nornir as a configuration management framework to be able to kind of pull the various things and tasks that we want to do together to be able to perform our use case. So yeah, we've got a lot to cover today, so it should be a good session. Uh, I've got a question already. Cool, thanks guys. Yep, I'm recording it. Yep. Yeah, so somebody just asked if we're recording it. We are recording it. And yeah, great. So let me let some more folks in. Right. Cool. Good stuff. So a quick introduction. So a bit about myself. So Rick Donato, many of you might already know me. Lots of experience in network automation, worked at lots of great companies and have an unhealthy love for, for coffee. So you can follow me if you want on Twitter slash X at Rick J Don or over there at LinkedIn. But I'm also founder of Packet Coders. And so what and who are Packet Coders? So Packet Coders is a learning platform, which is 100% dedicated to network automation. And so our goal in, in life and our mission statement is to basically teach the world network automation and to make it as easy as possible for you to learn it. And so we do this through many different ways, through guides, courses, we've got boot camps, instructor-led training, lots of free materi materials and resources such as blog. We've got monthly um, newsletters that go, that, that go out and we've, we're trying to build out and we've got various tools. So we've got, if you go onto our GitHub repo, you'll find tools such as things like Nornir Inspect and various other, you know, webinar code repos. So lots and lots of things. And if you want to become a member as well, then you can also go to Packet Coders and find out more about that. But all of all of that can be found out over at packetcoders.io. So let's dive into what we're we're here for today, which is this use case of automating automating our network configuration using these these three tools. So this is the big picture of what we're we're going to cover today. So I'm just having a look. There might be some more questions. No, we're all, all good. Okay, so the big picture. So we're basically going to use Netbox as a source of truth to hold our um, intended state, if you like, our, our various um, network attributes on how we want that, that, that network to look. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull this information down from that box and we're going to pull this information down. We're going to use it to populate and build out some, some network config. And we're going to use uh, Ginger templates to, to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to host our, our data within Netbox. We're going to pull that information down via GraphQL. And we'll explain why we're going to use GraphQL in a minute. We're going to push that data, if you like, into our, bring that data into our Ginger templates. We're going to render that config, and then we're going to write that, that rendered config to a file. Okay. And so there's going to be a few, few different moving bits here go, that we need to kind of dive into. And you'll see here, we've also got an inventory plugin. Uh, and as, as we'll see with Nornir, much like Ansible, you, you iterate over your your hosts within within an inventory. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of use the, the inventory plugin to pull the devices down from Netbox. 
so we can basically parameterize our, our query that, that's going out to GraphQL, which again, we'll talk a bit more about as we move on. But that's a high level picture of what we're, we're doing today. Good stuff. So, and you know, just to just kind of recap with this, this demo today, each of these tools can be used in their own right, right? So it makes, it's great to combine them in a single use case, but there's nothing to stop you just going off and using Netbox for one of the other use cases that it can be used for, or nor near for other things, or GraphQL for, you know, pulling data down for if you're wanting to do some testing and et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's just something else to, to remember. So the, these tools can be also used for various other use cases within the network automation domain. So Netbox, so what is Netbox? So ultimately Netbox is a, it's a tool that acts and holds this source of truth about our network. And this source of truth, basically you can think of it as a, it's a, it's a model that allows us to model our network and to hold that model that we can then use as a form of documentation or query that information to bring that down for whatever means we, we want to use that data for, i.e. rendering configs or, you know, testing our, our network. So yeah, it's a popular, it's an open source IPAM slash DCIM, and it's built on, on Python on using the Django framework. And yeah, it allows you to model and document your, your network. So, and it's got lots of good automation features, um, as I'll, I'll quickly touch upon in a second. Okay. So, you know, Netbox really sits there at the top as your source of truth, feeding that information into your various tools. Not so much, not really acting as an orchestrator, but just holding that, that network model with that, that data in on how your network should, should look. And so there's various, various you know, features of, of Netbox and, you know, as time's going on and it's maturing more and more, you know, it's all, it's already mega mature, but there's so many new features being added to it. It's, um, it's a really great tool, but it's got really good API support. So we've got, you know, REST support and also GraphQL. We can do webhooks with it. It's got good automation support when it comes to both nor near and, and Ansible. And you can do various other things with it as well. I'm not going to go through all of this because, because of time, but you know, you can do things such as rack elevations you can do custom reports and scripts, various, various things. And you can model various, you know, everything from your geographical locations all the way down to your actual, your actual cables to VLANs, various, you know, IP addresses. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scope in terms of how much and what you can actually model in terms of your infrastructure. Some of the other things that we're going to use today and some of these, these features is custom fields. So you can extend what can be placed into Netbox. And um, you can also provide within it um, config templates. We're not going to use that today. We're going to have the templates living outside. And like I mentioned before, it's good. It's got good support when it comes to Ansible and nor near. Um, I would say the Ansible support for Netbox is, is more mature than, than nor near. Nor near, you can just use it really as a, a dynamic inventory. And with um, the Ansible collection for, for Netbox, there's, there's a few more things you can do in terms of um, using Ansible to populate Netbox, but, um, but yeah, so there's, there's lots of things that we can, features we can use within Netbox to enable use cases like what we're going to see today. So some of the use cases you might want to use Netbox for, so you might want to use it as a dynamic inventory for non-near or Ansible. Say you're doing backups or audits of certain devices. You just want to know those IP addresses and the platform types. So. Ansible or nor near can connect out to that, that vendor type, that, that platform type correctly, or you can use it for rendering. So you can get, you, know, you can do native rendering within Netbox now, or you can get the data out from Netbox 
to then render your configs, which is what we're, we're going to be doing today. Or you might just want to have your, your network presented within uh, Netbox, and you can use that as a form of documentation or, or reporting, right? So just a quick show and tell. So I've got a Netbox instance here that I've populated for what we're going to do today. And so I'm not going to go through this in, in loads of detail, but, you know, I've set up a, under an organization, you can create your tenants. We've got Akamai One today. And under here, I've set up a single site. So a physical site, which I've got as my London DC. This global tech is for, for another uh, demo. You can set up your regions. You got, you can have parent regions, child regions. You can set up racks, et cetera, et cetera, contacts for the different devices and all of that. That's just under organization. And then the other key thing that we do is we set up our devices. So I've set up my devices within here, like so. So I've got um, two spines and six, yeah, six leaves. I've set them up just as Cisco devices within here and you set your IP addresses. Etc. So the the high level what what we actually do again not going to go into too much detail with this but you basically define a device type and you can import the device type from a, a template library and it acts as it's a bit like a class within Python so it's got all of your interfaces and how that device looks so console ports etc cetera, etc cetera, interfaces. And then what you do is when you create a device, you create a device against a device type, and then you basically kind of instantiate that, that device type, and then you've got all of those interfaces there. So you don't have to, when you create a device, you just give it the device type and you don't have to go in and you don't have to create all of the interfaces. You just create a device against the device type, and then you add in, you know, what the the individual parameters are for that device, such as like IP address, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I've got my devices in here, like so, for today. So that's all good. So we're going to be pulling out these IP addresses. So I've got my interfaces here. I've got my IP addresses set against these devices. That's all good. And something else I've done is I've created a couple of custom fields. Okay, so uh, domain name, and I think, yeah, we use OSPF area and router ID. So I've just created these. So you can create your, your custom fields. You define their type, like text or whether it's an integer, et cetera. And then what I've done is I've populated this, these fields within the devices. Okay, so going to spine one under custom fields, packet coders, my OSPF area. Okay, so we're also going to be, as well as pulling out the interfaces and the IP details with, for our template, we're also going to be populating. Um, we're also going to be utilizing and using this data from the, these custom fields as well. Okay. So we've got this source of truth sitting there. We've got this like model of our, our network. But how do we get the data? How do we get this data for, uh, thanks guys, I've got, there's a few questions coming in. So what I'm gonna do, I'll, I'll just have a look at the questions at the end, I think, if that's okay, um, just in the interest of time, and then we can uh, go through some of those. So, so we've got the, the network model. So how do we get the data out of our Netbox instance? Well, we could use uh, REST, but we've also got the ability to use GraphQL and we're gonna look at GraphQL now and explain why we're gonna use that over, over REST. So first of all, what is GraphQL? So GraphQL is a query language for APIs. And um, so it was originally developed by Facebook. So Facebook, they were building part of, um, of their application and they was fed up of having to go out and using REST to hit multiple different endpoints. 
right? And all of the post-processing that was involved with pulling the data down from different rest endpoints and, and bringing that together and then, and then kind of working through that. So what they've done is they, they built GraphQL to basically eliminate this, this issue and to allow the client to really define what data they get back from the, the server, right? So it, with GraphQL, the key thing is it basically, it prevents you from um, overfetching or underfetching the data that you're getting back from the system. So it makes it more uh, efficient in terms of performance. And so you can really, you can really define the data that you're getting back and get all of this data back to the client just from a single call rather than going out to multiple different endpoints. Uh, GraphQL also provides you with a schema definition language, which it allows you to go out to a GraphQL endpoint, pull back the schema for that GraphQL API, and you can actually validate the query before you send it over to the, to the, to the server, to the system. Right. So there's, there's that as well. Um, and I'll mention that again in a minute in another context. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a good thing to, to also note. So we will look at building a query in a second, um, within NetBox. So some of the GraphQL components that, uh, contained within, within GraphQL. We've got operations. So the two main operations are queries and mutations, right? Queries allowed us to allow us to read from a system and mutations allow us to write to the system. And today we're going to be looking at queries. You can use fragments. So you can basically create reuse, reusable pieces of a query. So kind of, you can think of that as you can build a nice dry query. There's uh, subscriptions, so you can then do asynchronous synchronous communication as well. You've got variables, so you can parameterize your queries, which we're going to be using today. Um, you can use aliases, and also there's a graph IQL environment, which you can use, which we're also going to be using today as well. Cool. So, you know, just to recap here, why you'd want to use GraphQL over something like REST. So REST, if you've got a client and this example is based on, on NetBox and the NetBox endpoints. You want to get some data from NetBox, say some cable data, some site data, some device data. And with REST, you'd need to go out to multiple different endpoints. Whereas with GraphQL, GraphQL presents you with a single endpoint, forward slash GraphQL, and you get all of that data back from that one endpoint. And it makes it, yeah far, far easier. So you, you really define the data that you want from the system um, on, that, on that client. So the other key point to mention here is that, you know, when you start diving into GraphQL, that it's when you first learn about GraphQL, it, it feels like, oh, this is going to be really confusing. But the thing to, to note is that all you're doing is you're writing a JSON payload, your query, and you're sending that over as a post to a single endpoint. So client builds a query and then posts that query over to a single endpoint. And really, as we're gonna see, that's all there is to it. So there's some other slight um, you know, complexities, if you like, when you start dry, uh, diving into GraphQL, i.e. you can actually get the client to request before it sends over the uh, GraphQL query, you can get your client to request the, the schema, that SDL from the, the GraphQL um, endpoint, send it back so you can validate your query. But today we're not, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna, we're gonna build something very simplistic with, with our query. So let's get into some meat of actually building um, a GraphQL query. So let's bring up this. Now, what I've done is, uh, where was my, uh, I'll go back to here. If I go back into NetBox, and get rid of this. Uh, 
the screen. Uh, okay, one sec. Where is mine? Okay, that'll do for some bit. Let me close this down. The screen's having a bit of a funny one. Right, okay, so when you go into Netbox, if you go down to the, the, the bottom, you'll see that you've got this GraphQL API. Click on there, and now we've got this GraphQL environment playground that we can play with. So I'll clear this and I'll clear that. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna step through this uh, this qu the, the query, we're going to build it up bit by bit for what we're going to need today. So let's just, um, let me see if I can clear this down. Okay. So, and I'll bring this up. Okay. So first of all, what we're going to do is we just provide in like a really basic query. Okay. So, so what we're going to do here is we're going to build a, um, a simple query. And so you define query, you, you got your brackets here and the object that we're going to basically send over and get the fields from. And in this case, we're going to use the device list object. And we're gonna, from the device list object, we're gonna pull out the name, okay? So we run this and we get this data back, right? Okay, that's all good. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. And so we get the name back for all of the devices in my netbox instance, okay? So that's okay, but there's a few things. What we need to do is we need to learn how to use the documentation, okay? So if we go over to here, we go to query, uh, what you're going to see here under fields, you're going to see all of the different objects. So these are the objects and these are the fields. So if we go down to what we're going to be looking at today, which is device list. Click on here. We get two things. We get the type and we get the arguments. We cover arguments in a minute, but in terms of type, if we click on type, these are all the fields that we can now specify. So if I put any of these fields within here, we're going to get that information back within our result. So that's, that's all good. So what we can do is if we, if we go down, we can then do individual fields. So we could do created, we could put last updated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But what you'll see here, you've got string, um, et cetera, but we've also got various other types. And this is where we can drill down even further. So if I go to platform type, I've got further fields, okay? So if we go down to, where is it, platform? So we type in here, platform. And we look at this platform type, and now we can see the fields under platform, okay? So we then, do this like so, and now we could put in the name of our platform. And then we can build, keep, you know, building out this query. And now we've got all of this data back, right? Okay. Caveat is, is that the, the data we get back does become a little bit nested. But, you know, the good thing is you can really think of this as you're really simplifying all of that you know, those headaches that you sometimes have with building multiple different kind of um, query parameters with REST, uh, a REST API. And so you, that's kind of what you're, you're kind of doing here, right? So, you know, you can build this out more and more. But what else can we do? Well, first of all, when we do a query, query actually allows us to drop the query operation like so. So we can run this and it still runs. Okay. So I personally, 
I quite like putting query here because it's explicit in our in what we're doing, our intent. So the other excuse me, the other thing that we we looked at or we saw a minute ago was the arguments. Okay. So we looked at the fields. But if we go back, we had the device type that we clicked on, we've got the arguments. So these are all the arguments that we can do to further filter the data that, that we're getting back. Okay, so let's say we only wanted to filter out and look at a single device. We could use, there's name down here. Is it? Uh, oh, there it is, name, which is a string. And what you do, you do brackets like so, name, and in our case, we're just going to do leaf one and close that off. And now we've only got this back like so. So this is going to be the basis of what we're going to be doing today to get our, our data back. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is we need a way of being able to parameterize this this query, right? So to be able to pass in variables to here. Though in essence, it would be nice if you could just use string formatting and pass in a variable within Python, but it, it doesn't really work out like that. So what we can do is we can use the, the variable feature of GraphQL to allow us to parameterize this query. And this is what we do. So we create a variable like so, and we call it device name. So what we, what we want to do is we want to move this leaf one into a variable. And what we do is this. So we've got our device list here, like so, but we basically create a, a custom query and we define here our, our variable name and here, we say that we're going to pass in a string. Now, this is going to require um, that we set this as an array. And then this is basically like a, it's a basically, a, you know, type uh, type enforcement. So it's, it's got to be a string within this array. And this um, exclamation mark here is basically saying that we're not going to allow the array to be empty. Okay. You could also put here exclamation to say that this is not allowed to be empty as well, the, the string uh, within, within it. So, so yes, so that's, that's all good. So we've got that there. Now, and then we just pass in for the, the name, the argument like before, but then we give it the name of our variable. And then we're going to build out all of the details and the data we need to get back from Netbox a little bit further, like so, like we, we want the custom fields, we want the device type, platform, interfaces, et cetera. And we can run this. And now we've got all this data back. So now all we need to do is pass in, we've got a way of being able to pass in um, various devices through the GraphQL variables. And this is what uh, we're going to use to be able to basically run this within within nor near. So let's go back to so right. So you know we've built this query, we can get the data back from our source of truth. But the next thing is is like it's great to be able to run the query within this this playground that graph IQL playground, but how do we automate it? Uh, and basically this is how we're, we're gonna do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build the headers for our query. We're going to set our graph to our variables like we did a minute ago. And then we're just gonna use requests because at the end of the day, all we're doing is we're sending over a query to the graph to endpoint, which is just using um, HTTP and just using the post method, right? So we set our URL, we set 
our JSON payload, which is going to be our GraphQL query. We're going to start query key. And then we're going to also then set our, our variables. And then we pass in our headers. Okay. So at the point that we send this over, the only thing that we've not got on this screen is the GraphQL query. But we're, I'll show you that in a minute. At the point that we send this over, we're going to get that same JSON back that we just saw a minute ago. And you know, life is life is good, and then we can work with that with that data. So let's uh, clear this. So we can query the data. We can collect all the data. We've got a way of being able to run, you know, GraphQL within some Python. How do we stitch this together with with Ginger and and the various other things that we want to do, like write into a file, et cetera, et cetera, and running this against all of the hosts. So this comes to, now to the next part of our use case, which is nor near our co configuration management framework. And so when I say configuration management framework, you know, what I'm talking about is really a framework that's going to allow us to, it's going to give us an inventory so we can run this against multiple hosts, iterate over the hosts within an inventory. We can bring in variables. We've got the concurrency as well. And also it's going to give us various plugins to make our life easier. So we don't have to write the boilerplate for doing the ginger parsing or the ginger rendering right into a file, all of that kind of stuff. And so this is where Nornir is going to come in. So what is Nornir? So Nornir is a open source tool framework and it's, it's networks, network focused. It's very similar, if you like, to, to Ansible, but it's 100% Python, okay? So there, there is no DSL. So there is no YAML that you have to declare your tasks within and to kind of, I dare say, like sometimes fight against, but everything you do is done in Python. And this one makes it easier when you get to some of those nuances that you get with Ansible. And also it's much faster and it also makes it much easier for debugging, right? So you can use all your favorite debuggers that you use in Python, you know, PDB, Rich Inspect, and whatever it might be. So it's, yeah, it's a really good open source, you know, config management framework. It's really, really lean. Everything you want to do with it, you typically use a plugin for. So it's nice and lean. It's multi-threaded. So you've got the concurrency. And it's, it's, the, it's the framework that you're going to use if, so if you want to bring in things like, you know, Scrapply or Napalm, those are the tools that you're going to bring in via plugins. Okay, so you can kind of see, you know, two different config management stacks. You've got your Nornir with your, your plugins of Scrapply or Napalm and NetMeco, et cetera, there as your kind of uh, your pure Python, completely decoupled stack. And then if you like, you've got something which is a little bit more, yes, you have collections, but a little bit more of a kind of monolithic config management framework, which is Ansible, where everything's within that one, that one tool, right? Um, and I say that because if you said, well, actually, I want to use the, I want to use the network uh, connectivity driver out of Ansible within another tool or something like Nornir, you know, you can do it. it, it there is, there is a level of, of coupling. So yeah, Nornir is a, is a really good tool. Don't get me wrong. Ansible is great. There's things that Nornir doesn't do that Ansible does. Nornir at the box doesn't give you the asynchronous output that um, you get with, with Ansible. And also things like, the, you know, the callback plugins are more, uh, a little bit more kind of mature in Ansible than you do with, um, with an Ansible than you do with Nornir when it comes to the, the, the processes, but, um, but it's good. So this is what we're going to use today to basically build those different tasks that we can, we can use and, um, for our, for our use case. So within Nornir, what we do is. And the other thing I was going to mention as well, which I should have done, is with Nornir, you have a script, 
and you define what you want to do as tasks, right? So you define your task. It might be that you want to back up some config, et cetera. And you define the what within your Nornia script by your tasks. And then you run your task against all of your devices um, using uh, these functions. So your tasks run on a per host basis against your inventory, the who, the much like Ansible. And, and pretty much that's all there is to it. You initialize nor near, you do some filtering against your inventory, you build your task, and then you run your task against all of your hosts. And that is what we're going to be doing today. So with nor near tasks, as I mentioned, tasks allow you to define an action and they are run on a per host basis. They are just a, it's just a Python function. And with tasks, you get a, you know, you get a few different flavors, i.e. you can create your own task um, or you can use a task that someone else has created and you can bring in via a plugin. So that's what we're also going to do today. We're going to create one task, which is custom, and we're going to reuse some other tasks as well. But ultimately, you create your task, you give it an input if you want. So you always have to pass in the task object, any inputs that you want to provide it. In this case, we're just going to provide number. You do whatever you want to do. In this case, this is not network specific. This is just, you know, multiplying this number. And then you return whatever you want out. And that's what um, you can use that result further on within other tasks if you want. And you'll be able to see that within your output or, or um, you know, you don't even have to return a result if you don't want to. But once you've got that task built, you then do a run. You define and specify the task that you want to run and any inputs. So that's what we've got there. We've got this input like so. This is coming into here. Specifying this task, which is here. And it's going to run this against all of the hosts that we've specified within our inventory. Oh, good stuff. So let me clear this down. Oh, sorry, one sec. Cool. Okay. As I mentioned, Nornir is extremely lean, right? It's everything you want to do with it, you do via uh, plugins. So you just do a Nornir dash in the name of the plugin or Nornir underscore, depending on the plugin. And so to install Nornir, you know, just outside of the plugins, the core, you just do a pip install Nornir. And we're going to use three plugins today. We're going to do a use the Nornir uh, Netbox plugin to pull our inventory from Netbox. We're going to use Nornir Utils for writing to a file, and then we're going to use Nornir Ginger just for rendering our templates. So just to quickly recap on what we're going to be doing here, right? So we've got this graph to our query, filling this down. And if I just quickly go over to here, so what we're going to do is we're going to define this as a task, this as a task, and this as a task. This guy here is going to be a, a custom task. This guy, we're going to bring in that, that plugin that I mentioned a minute ago. And we're going to use this plugin to another plugin to write to a file from Norni Utils. So this one's going to be Norni Utils. This one's going to be the Ginger 2. This, gun's, this one's going to be custom. So in to total, we're going to have three tasks that we're going to, uh, we're going to use. We're going to wrap those within one main task. So you can actually like run tasks within other tasks within Norni. Sounds a bit confusing, but it's one of those things. As soon as you see it within the code, it, it, it just makes sense. So that's what we have got. So let's clear this down. And let's move over to our BS code. So we've got 
our code here. I'm not going to go into it in, in you know, massive detail, but I'm just going to just do a quick uh, skip through. And before I do, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to run, the, run some of this code as well um, just to show you how it looks. So this is what I was speaking about before in terms of out, this is completely outside of um, nor near. And this is just running that query against Netbox using GraphQL. Okay. So we've got that query like before. I showed you with the device name, just specifying in the device name. I'm just doing the requests and I'm doing a post, sending that out to my Netbox FQDN, getting the response back, and I'm just going to print the, the data that I get back. Okay. So and we've got the data back. Okay. And so this is all of that data for one device. This is the data that we're going to use for rendering our, our config. Okay. So let's, um, this is what I rendered before. So I'm going to delete these configs that we created. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this rendering and running first before I show you the code. So I've got my Nornia script here with my tasks defined uh, like so. So and now we've got all of the configs generated. So this is all generated configs using the config from and that data from that box. Nice and quick. And yeah, so that that's all good. What's the actual Nornir script look like? So it looks like this. We've got the Nornir script. We've got a Jinja template here, which is just going to reference the, the data that we're going to pass into this template. Doing a bit of looping, you know, the, the normal Jinja stuff that we, we need to do. Let's open this up. Cool. So it might run a few minutes over, but it's, it's okay. So we've got our Nornia script. We've got our GraphQL query using these variables. And then what we're going to do is we've got one main task, Nornia task. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write a task to perform our GraphQL query. So pretty much just the lift and shift of what we did before in that other script where we just queried one device. I've moved that into a task. But the only difference is, is that what I've done is instead of specifying leaf one here, I'm pulling out the actual device name from the task object that is pulled in at the point that we run this task, right? Because every time you run it, each task is run on a per host basis. So that means each time this runs, this task object is available. And within this task object, we have various goodies. And one of the things that we can use and pull out is the host name that it's currently running upon. So that's what we do here. This is going to return out the it's going to do the GraphQL query, and then we're going to return that out. We're going to pass that into our result. Okay. That means that when we run this task against dot result, the attribute, we've got that data available to us. And now once this is our custom task, if you like, the other tasks, we're not going to write our own. We're going to reuse the ones that we've imported in. So I've imported in the Ginger 2 plugin task and the one for write file. Cool. So we've got that. So we basically run our task for our GraphQL. And now we've got all of the data there from Netbox for an individual device. And then we run another task to render our template. So we access the result by dot result, and then we unpack all of that data 
to make it available within our Jinja template. We pass in some bits and pieces like where the, the Jinja template lives, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also going to pass in the IP address um, object just so we can use that. We have to do a, we have to do a little bit of massage in, in terms of converting a CIDR into a standard net mask for the interface, but um, but that's what we use that for. But you can dive into the code as and when you want. The other thing I should have mentioned is that all of this code is going to be available to you in a repo, and I'll, I'll give you the QR code at the end of the session. Now, once we've done that, we've got our rendered code. So our rendered config here against here, against this. So this is the output from our task. Again, we need to access this um, output, the result from this via dot result. And so we use this dot result against another task, so task run, and then we use the write file task to write this to a file. And that's, that's going to be all of the operations. Those three things that we want to perform, the GraphQL query, the rendering, and then write into a file. So we write, then run this main task against our inventory, it renders, and we're just going to print the result. So what happens is you run this against your devices. It stores the result, which is basically a result, a result structure slash tree. It's quite nested, but you pass this into a print result function and it's going to print the output. And that's what we've got here. Okay. So this is showing us all of the different output and the steps of this running against all of our devices. So yeah, life is good. And now we've, we've stitched all of that together. And, you know, this is the kind of same thing that you can do as well. If you want to plug GraphQL into things like PyATS or PyTest to run it, the data or to test the data, the intended state from that box with stuff like Batfish, et cetera, et cetera. So that opens up a lot of uh, possibilities. Cool. Okay, good stuff. So great. So what next? So, you know, you've learned all this, you want to dive further into, into this. You might be kind of thinking, oh, good. GraphQL is good. We Nornir looks great. Where can I go next? And really, that is where, you know, the packet coders membership and platform can really come in, right? We've got a course on Nornir, we've got courses on Batfish, PyTest. We've got tech sessions on GraphQL, tons of code repos. So you can, you can use all of that. And, you know, we've got code repos for all of the courses, which really act as, you know, giant cheat sheets, if you like, to really kind of help you with your network automation learning. So today, a crazy 35% off yearly memberships. And if you want to access this, this webinar promo, just go to this link. I'll also send it out after this. This session is going to end tomorrow. So you've got that there, you know, as a thank you for jumping on to today's session. So just to summarize today, what we've learned, we've learned about the role of Netbox as a source of truth, the, the role and benefits of GraphQL for querying data over something like REST and how to build those queries, the roles and benefits of something, uh, a config management framework like Nornir and how to integrate these things together to be able to generate your, your Jinja templates. There's the QR code if you want to grab the, uh, the, the repo and the, all of the code examples from today. Um, and yeah, I hope you found today useful. I feel like, you know, we've covered a lot. Time went crazy quick, but, um, but yeah, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, really enjoyed doing today's session three really good tools. And yeah, if you've got any questions, happy to stick around for a little bit longer and answer anything you've got. Cool. Thanks guys. Um, there's some really nice comments on there. So really appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks all. Uh, sure. So you're asking for the link. Yes, I will um, share that on the screen. Here's the link for the 
promo. So I'm kind of going to go through these questions a bit in reverse, to be honest, because there's um, it's going to go from uh, the bottom up. Um, okay, actually, it might be better if I go from top down. Otherwise, the new question is going to pop pop in. Okay, so oh, great! I've only just seen your message, Cameron. So. Uh, Any reason for netbox over Norto bot? Um, to be honest, I've not really used Norto bot um, too much. I I'm a big fan of netbox. I think it's a great tool. I, I really like the community with netbox. Um, you know, net Norto bot has has got a ton of features, but um, but yeah, um, personally, big fan of netbox myself. Not really not really dived into Norto bot too much. Uh, for the interfaces of a device, do you have to provide info for different platforms? Uh, for the interfaces of a device, do you have to provide info for different platforms like the... Yeah, I think this is... Okay, I think that one's already answered. Some Basically, someone asked, for the interfaces of a device, do you have to provide info for different platforms? Um, you do, yeah, like Chris was saying, that comes from the device type library. So all of the different interfaces are kind of pre-created within the device type library. So you kind of bring them in. So you don't have to manually go through and create all those different interfaces. You just then just populate the individual unique attributes of, of those, those interfaces based on the device, like IP address, et cetera. Another question, is it fair to say this is quite dependent on use case? GraphQL is cool, especially single endpoints. But there's also things like PyNetbox for pure Python scripts, which has its quirks too. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, PyNetbox is going to be using, the thing with PyNetbox, I think it's good, so PyNetbox being a Python library, but um, it's, you know, that's going to rely on REST as well. So you're still going to have to have a, you've still got a level of post-processing that you're going to need to do. And sometimes with um, PyNetbox, it doesn't always support then all of the features within the API. So then you get like a little bit shackled from that side of things. So, so yeah, I mean, I would say the amount of code that you need to write for GraphQL is pretty, um, pretty small, pretty compact. So it's it's a good uh, GraphQL is a good good alternative. Can you update info in Netbox databases using GraphQL? That is a really good question. At the moment, you can't. There, to be able to update a system via GraphQL, you would have to use a GraphQL mutation and mutations aren't supported within Netbox at the moment. Can we use Ansible to query data using GraphQL? Just curious to know if Nornir is much preferred to render config from Net Netbox versus Ansible. So yeah, you can ultimately, because you're just using HTTP post, with some JSON, you could easily you can easily do that within Ansible. Norn is good because it's 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 faster. But you know, if you're using Ansible, yeah, great, you can do it in Ansible. There is no. It kind of depends on what you're using. If you're, you, yeah, if you're using Ansible, then you can use it in that in that framework. If you want to use Norn, you can use it in that. Personally. I really like using Nornir, but I completely get that a lot of companies are already using Ansible because the other teams are using it for cloud deployments, for server deployments. And that's cool. You know, Ansible is a great tool. So, you know, the biggest limitation with Ansible really, I would just say is the speed, but it's, it's got a lot of, a uh, lot of features in there. So, and in terms of the code, actually that's in the packet coders membership are within our GraphQL tech session, you've got 
all of the code to be able to use GraphQL with, with Ansible. Yep. So you can dive into, dive into that. Just looking for any more questions. John, you asked, uh, how would you approach a Greenfield customer with this solution? Um, feel free to expand on that. I'm not too sure. If you want to unmute, then. One more. Uh, yeah. Hey, Rick. Hey. Uh, just, you know, I noticed, you know, you had all the information that you, you already knew all the information to populate NetBox. If you were going to try to initiate the solution or execute the solution at a brand new customer where you didn't have all that information, is, are the steps any, any different or is that just a manual effort? Because what you need initial... IP information, credentials, and all that stuff to to get it set up. Is that something you would normally use a tool to extract from the devices? You know, with obviously you would need credentials for that part, but would you then get everything from the live configs, or do you would you start fresh with NetBox and enter everything manually? Yeah. So are you talking like a brat? Are you talking like a brownfield? Um, like kind of deployment where you've well, already got a network running or yeah i guess it's more brownfield but i guess what i'm getting at is you wouldn't have you know all of that information so is this would you use automation to pull that information in to populate netbox like kind of a reverse flow there or would you just have to manually go enter it all no, I mean, I would say, yeah, definitely use automation. So, yeah, so there's a few things. A really good question is there is a, there was a tool that Netbox was developing. I, I'm not too sure that this, this, the stage that that was at, but um, in terms of, you know, discovery and population of Netbox, but there's a couple of different ways you can go with it is to actually go out to the network and to, to pull that back in. It's, it's quite a big job, right? There's quite a lot involved with, with that. So you could, you know, you could roll up your sleeves and, and, and do that yourself, but you're going to find that it's, it's pretty, um, there's, qu there's quite a lot involved with that. So no doubt come... a lot of mistakes will be made too. That's why I'm, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there's, there's a company called, um, a slurp it, which come out like about a month ago, uh, and they. I should be on commission, right? <laughs> but they come out about a month ago and their tool basically is all about discovery and it, it discovers the network, scans the network, and then you can use that to populate your, your netbox instance. So that's one option. You could, you've got the slurp it option. You've got, you can create your own or, you know, you can go for the, uh, you know, the deluxe option, if you like, which is something like IP Fabric. And I think the guys there have just released a like synchronization feature or plugin that brings everything into to Netbox. So you've got that as a, a kind of real, you know, your your deluxe option. But um but those are the main the main ones. In terms of just getting data into, you know, there's another way you can go about this as well is with Ansible, there's a module within the Ansible Netbox collection. There's a set of modules that allows you to populate Netbox just through just from YAML. So if you know if you can get that data into YAML in some kind of format that you can use and, and, and bring that into Ansible, then you can use that to, to then also populate and build out Netbox as well. So um, so you've got those options. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. I was just, cause that would be the, obviously the first task is to get all the data that you can from the existing network instead of having to mm -hmm. recreate everything and make a bunch of human mistakes. Yeah. I would say you, you utilize a dev the device type, uh, device type template library. And then, yeah, if you can bring in, 
um, just some of those, you know. I mean, would it make I would sense probably... to, to, to bridge in Batfish for that? Or would that complicate it? You, you could do. I mean, you, you could use Batfish to get the data from configs and then to like normalize that in a way to be able to kind of get that into Netbox. You can do that. And in fact, with the, the network importer that was brought out by Network to Code a while ago, that's how, that's how that tool works, right? They basically, they use various forms of discovery. And one of the biggest forms of discovery they used was to use um, uh, Batfish to get the, all, all of that, that goodness, that data out from the configs to be able to then pass in. But I mean, you can do it and you can get quite a long way doing that. But I would always, always just be wary that, you know, roll in your own sometimes. There's, there's, there's always more to it than you think, right? There's always the devil's in the detail. So personally, what I would do is I, I would probably go down the road of looking at something like Slurp IT. I've, um, or oh, sorry, Slurp it. I would look at that first and then, because I think there's a free tier that they offer and they might be able to kind of save you a lot of the headaches that you're, you're going to come across if you're needing to do the discovery. So, and, and if they, if that doesn't work for you, then, then look at maybe rolling your own and, and going from there. Thanks. So, but I'll, I'll send over the link for that Slurp IT because it's, um, it does look good. Yeah, I found it here, slurpit.io. Uh, cool. Yeah, feel free to stick it in the chat for other people because I think it, it, it bridges exactly because with the question you've got comes up time and time again, again, and they've really just, you know, they found that niche and they, uh, they're kind of looking to plug that. So, so yeah. Um, another question, Rick. GraphQL is a library you import into Python to send a query to a REST API or is a server-side plugin? Yeah, so graph so GraphQL is basically what you you use on the server side, on the API side, to allow for that uh, GraphQL querying of your of your API. Um, so you can use an you know GraphQL libraries within you know whatever flavor of language you're using, Python, whatever. So um, but you know, GraphQL, you're also asking import it into Python. So, yeah, so GraphQL and REST API, the two different, you know, API types, if you like, um, which is something that's installed and performed on the, you know, that query and that GraphQL querying enablement of the API is done on the server side. But from the client side, you send over a GraphQL request. Not to be confused that you can also install GraphQL client side libraries. So one thing I didn't mention is if you wanted to, you could, instead of using requests, you could use, um, one sec. Rather than using requests, you could also use uh, the G GQL library, which does some of the GraphQL um, goodness, like the the schema validation, et cetera, makes all of that easier for you. But um, so yeah, it's just to separate those two things, right? Client server. Hopefully that helps. If if not, just let me know. Sure, sure Rick. This is Julian. I, I was the one oh, asking yeah. that question. And that really quick, and and this this is your for my my home lab. I'm just testing, right? I have a class API, right? That is talking with with a MongoDB, right? And it's just for the learning process. Mm -hmm. And on my MongoDB, I have my device, my, my data models, right? I have devices, interfaces, right? So I pull the data via request or Ansible URI, right, to the fast API, mm -hmm. and I get the details that I need, which in with Fast API mm -hmm. goes back to Mongo and gets the data I need. 
But yeah. now that I was, and this is the first time I'm actually reading and, 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 and learning about GraphQL. So I'm like, okay, how do I, how do I get to learn GraphQL, right? Should I, should I stand up a service that goes, well, so I talk to GraphQL and then GraphQL goes to my fast API to get the data out of there. Is, is that, I'm understanding that correctly, that, that flow is, is. Uh, yeah, so what you would do, I've not, I've not gone and done that within fast uh, API, but like ultimately what you need to do is if you've got, uh, you've got an API, you would install a, like a server side library to run within fast, uh, fast API and you would then set up various resolvers against your, your data. Um, but that is, yeah, that's kind of what you want to do. I, I think, um, yeah, I've not really done it myself, but the, I would probably go down the road of looking at what NetBox are using for their, for their GraphQL on their server side. But, um, but yeah, you want to look at, look into using resolvers with fast API, GraphQL resolvers with fast API. Resolvers. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you could go directly to the REST API on NetBox or GraphQL, right? Meaning there is a, there is a, there is that interaction within NetBox between GraphQL and the, the local API, right? Or the REST API. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the way, what you do is you basically, you install the server side uh, library and then you set up these resolvers to basically say, uh, resolve these different objects. You like assign these objects and these resolvers to different, uh, like the different models. So within uh, NetBox, you've obviously got models because it's based on Django. So you set these resolvers up against these different uh, models and these different objects within NetBox. And then that presents out then a, like a GraphQL endpoint. And then when you come into the GraphQL endpoint, it then um, uses, uses those resolvers to then work through that that client side query and to get the data back so um so it would be you know data on your server on your system that you then like link in and integrate with those resolvers and that graphql library that you're going to install makes sense um, yeah yeah, yeah. It, it totally makes sense yes yeah but it's Thank a, you so much, that's Rick. A really, that's a really good way of learning it, though, as well, um, from that side of things. So that, that, that sounds cool. Sounds like a right. good, Thank uh, you. good project. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks for your no yeah, thanks. Okay. Just looking if... Okay, cool. I think we're pretty much... We're quite enough, yeah, 10 past, uh, 10 past 9. So, yeah, thanks to everyone who's uh, stayed on. Um, I glad that everyone's found it useful it's been a good session went crazy quick so yeah thanks again for attending and definitely get the recording out you will also receive an email with the link and yeah have a great day everyone thanks <laughs>